All right, let's get into a little bit of news of the day issue. Some of your colleagues have raised concerns about who President Trump has nominated to replace Director Pompeo at the CIA, Gina Haspel. Do you have concerns? Similar about concerns, that? and that's why I am looking forward to the hearing. Um, I think uh, all of these questions should be fully vetted, but absolutely I have concerns about what I've heard about her past and her involvement um, and um, the waterboarding and her um, uh, my concerns that I've seen. Uh, and I think at, at the end of the day for me, which has always been with this administration, listening to hearings, listening to what they have to say, and then making a determination after that. With regards, just a quick follow-up, to waterboarding, two areas of tor to torture, do you support that? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, and uh, listen, I saw uh, and uh, support what John McCain has said about this, what my colleague Tammy Duckworth, listen, I had conversations with her about this. Uh, we should all be concerned about any type of torture that is going on and, and, and not only standing up against it, but holding those individuals who are engaged and supported that type of conduct accountable. But does it immediately disqualify her? Everybody's entitled to a hearing, right? So she's, she's been nominated, let's put her through the hearing, let's ask the tough questions, and then we make those determinations as we move forward. Uh, before we get to, to Dodd-Frank, uh, earlier uh, the Trump administration announcing a new round of sanctions against Russia. Is this enough? Is this? What do you make of that? It's about time, right? So I said on banking committee, uh, we have been very adamant about sanctions moving forward, particularly against Russia and their interference in our election process. They need to be held accountable. And so uh, not only do I support these, we need to continue uh, to use whatever financial sanctions we can um, to, to hold their feet to the fire and show the world that you can't, you don't get away with this. You don't get to interfere uh, with our democracy and get away with it. Dodd Frank, you're on the Senate Banking Committee. You voted against a bill that would walk back key portions of Dodd Frank. Some of your colleagues voted for it. Why are you against this bill? It rolls back consumer protections, rolls back some important uh, oversight and protections uh, on these big banks. And remember, uh, I come from Nevada. I was attorney general there from 2007 to 2014. We were ground zero for the foreclosure crisis. The very banks that this uh, bill rolls back protections on, I sued because they had a big footprint in Nevada. They engaged in subprime uh, lending, and I had concerns about it. And that's why I supported Dodd-Frank reform to put these protections in place. The other thing that I have seen here is during that time, there was a lot of housing discrimination that was occurring as well. And that's why one of my amendments that I wanted, hopefully was hoping to get introduced, would protect against any type of rolling back against uh, collecting the data to ensure there's no housing discrimination. Unfortunately, that did not occur. So there's a rollback of consumer protections. Uh, there's an oversight of these big banks uh, that is being um, eroded, and, and I can't support that. What about folks who say, well, this is community banking regulatory relief, that it lifts the threshold of $250 billion to, in assets, that that threshold, that for folks underneath that, that there shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all prescription of regulation for some of these community banks. Now, remember, those aren't community banks. Those are regional banks. Those are big banks. And some of these big banks are the ones that I went after and we, that were part of the national mortgage settlement, right, because they had a major footprint. So let, let me just couch this and say, Absolutely. I've talked with the community banks in Nevada. I've talked with the credit unions. I do agree that one size doesn't fit all when we're talking about regulations. I think they, they should have been tweaked with respect to these small community banks and credit unions who are in our communities. But at the same time, I felt that the big banks co-opted that. They co-opted that dialogue and that bipartisan support that we were looking at for our, our small banks and our credit unions, and I can't support it. Where would you like to see the threshold at? I, it's more than just a threshold. Uh, it, it is not only talking about the threshold, but it's more about um, the oversight. And, and let me say this, because now what we are doing with this reform is what we are saying, well, let's, let's, you know, the safety and soundness of these banks, let's give it back to the regulators. Well, the regulators had it prior to 2007. Where were they? Well, right? Some of them didn't even exist. That's right. <laughs> and, and now let's talk about who those regulators are, right? Secretary Mnuchin. Well, my goodness, he was owned One West, which gained, engaged in robo-signing in Nevada that I sued, we went after, right? And then we have Mulvaney now, who has been tasked with uh, now coming into the CFPB and gutting it. So no, I have concerns about any type of rollback that we say now, let's give it back to the regulators. They weren't there before, and the regulators they have now were part of the problem, at least I know of, in Nevada. Democrats are divided on this, and you know this. The vote was 67 to 31. 17 Democrats, or 16 plus one independent, uh, who frequently lobbies with the Democrats, voted in favor with Republicans. What do you say to your colleagues 
who said no. And uh, it's a conversation we have. First of all, let me just say, I think this, this process um, should be open to debate. That's what we do. We debate policy. We're not all going to agree. I don't care whether you're R or D or, or an independent. It's about the policy. There should be a, a light shined on it, and we should all be open to introducing amendments and moving forward. That didn't happen here. This wasn't regular order. I want people to understand that. Um, the other thing I, I know is I, I respect my colleagues. I know my colleagues, if you're talking about the Democrats who supported this, they're concerned with those small banks and credit unions that I just talked about. But for me, I couldn't support it because the way that the big banks co-opted that uh, support we had for small banks and credit unions to the big banks' advantage, which was going to continue to hurt, uh, I believe, this country and, and could potentially put us in the same situation that I saw back in 2007 when we entered this crisis, this foreclosure crisis in Nevada. And you've got to remember, Nevada was ground zero for 62 months in a row. My gosh, we had the highest foreclosure rate in the country. More people had negative equity in their homes, 70% or more, than anyone else in the country. It was devastating to us. And Nevada is just now, the last two years, our, our economic indicators are good. We're coming out of it. I don't ever want to see that happen again. Your colleague, Senator Elizabeth Warren, who also voted against this bill, called it, quote unquote, outrageous. And she said that folks, even within the Democratic Party who supported it, ought to be held accountable. Do you think that there's room in the Democratic Party for folks who, to vote against this bill and not be labeled as only in line or only in favor with the big banks? Yeah, I, I believe that and what I just said is that this is about the policy. We debate the policy. This isn't personal. This is about the policy. Everybody comes from a different state. You're representing different interests. But the policy should be open. Everybody should have an amendment. And here's what I mean. I sit on the banking committee. I was able to also introduce amendments through the banking committee. A number of my colleagues don't sit on the banking committee. When do they have an opportunity to introduce an amendment? On the floor, when this comes to the floor, but they didn't get that opportunity. So to me, it is about the process and regular order and letting not only the public see and shine a light on it, but allowing my colleagues all to debate the policy. That's what should be happening here. When you look at the, the, the vote on this, and I don't want to juxtapose this to the, to the special election in Western Pennsylvania, but there does seem to be an interesting tension here between more centrist folks on the financial issues within your party as well as folks who are against that. And then you look at Connor Lamb. What do you think that election tells us about, number one, where the progressive grassroots are, and number two, about the mood in the electorate right now. Can, can we read anything out of this special election that you know the whole chattering class is chattering about? <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you coming from Nevada, which is a purple state. It, it's about what Connor did and every single person who's winning, connecting with voters and talking about the issues they care about. It is actually going into their homes or going into their communities, I don't care whether they're red or blue, and talking what is important to them. And what I found in Nevada was economic security. I don't care who you were, I don't care if you were a student or a senior or a business owner or a farmer or a rancher, it was about your economic security and it looks different for, di for different people based on what your needs are. If you're a senior, it's being able to afford your prescription drugs and still put food on the table and pay your medical bills, right? If you're a small business owner, it's access to capital, keeping those doors open so we can continue to employ people in the community and be successful in, in that community. So it is about taking the time to talk to people listening to what their concerns are and say, yeah, I'm going to be your voice and I'm going to fight for you. I did that in Nevada and I believe that my colleagues and what Connor Lamb did and many others, they're doing the same thing. Last topic, because you brought it up and that's about housing. There's been a lot of questions and Senate Banking also has jurisdiction over uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and the housing regulatory oversight. You brought up uh, housing discrimination. You wrote an op-ed recently about that in particular. What needs to be done to better protect folks uh, in what would you like to see done on that particular issue? Well, first of all, I, I would have stricken Section 104, which should be struck from this particular this reform bill, because we need to collect the data. We need to ensure that the underwriters, when they collect this data and it goes to the banks and the mortgage loans are being offered, that the data tells us there's no housing discrimination. Because what we have seen in the past, if you're a, a person of color or you're a woman, less chances you're going to get a mortgage loan to own that first home. And we know that redlining occurred in the past, right? 
if you came from a minority community, you were redlined and you were a high risk just because of the color of your skin. So we've put things in place and laws in place to protect against that. But I still saw it happen. And my colleagues across the country when I was attorney general, we still saw that happening after the 2007 crisis. So we changed Hamda to add additional data points to ensure that we can protect against and see any type of pattern of discrimination. That's being rolled back. So that needs to be put in, that, re, that needs to be reinforced. Secretary Carson of the of, of HUD uh, recently having some changes to the rhetoric regarding diversity. And then you look at this piece of legislation that just advanced out of the Senate. What do you make of, of that development? My concern, again, is, is not only what we see in the rollback of HUD, HUMDA, but what we've seen with particular to HUD. Not only the budget cuts that this administration wants to make to HUD, um, the um, policies that are coming out of not only the secretary of this administration on their um, stand on housing in general. If you come to Nevada, affordable housing is a, is a crisis in the state of Nevada. Whether it's not enough uh, inventory, or the rents are too high, or there's not workforce housing, it is a crisis. And we need to figure out how we, in, in, at the federal level, we incentivize those, uh, that inventory, those, those, uh, uh, those housing units to be built, how we incentivize local communities and, and, and local governments to support uh, affordable housing in their communities. Uh, that's not happening right now. And because not only is this administration not taking the leadership on it, I haven't seen the Secretary uh, Carson taking a leadership on it. So now it's going to be incumbent upon Congress to fight to keep the money in, to fight for those tax credits for affordable housing, to do everything we can uh, to support our community. Final question, Secretary Carson, everything that's going on with uh, some questions about how he's spending money within the department. you have any comment on that? Yeah, uh, it's outrageous. $31,000 for a dining set, uh, spending more money on, <laughs> quite frankly, on furnishing, I'm assuming, uh, his uh, uh, office. Uh, when he should be fighting about uh, affordable housing, uh, when we should be addressing homelessness uh, in this country that we see, uh, when we should be fighting to ensure that we have CDBG dollars, right, going in our, to our communities to support this housing. This administration continues to gut, and so and uh, I don't see anything coming out of Secretary Housing, gutting the CDB jo D CDBG dollars that are so important for our communities for housing. So let's have that conversation instead of spending the money frivolously, and I think is outrageous.